All right, Gilded Age politics. How does the party system work in America? What do we tend to have in a way of parties? Political parties. By the way, do you know what political parties are? They're voluntary associations that get together of like-minded Americans who want certain policies passed, either on the city level or on the state level or on the federal level. Uh, what would make you be like-minded? What policies would you care about? Public safety. Public safety might be one. Okay. That would be a, maybe a federal or state policy. What are some other policies that people care about a lot? What? So could we call that an economic policy? And economic policy could include uh, taxes. It could include uh, whether or not we have tariffs on imported products. Could it include uh, wages in the workplace? What are some other policies that Americans care about? Would the government may or may not allow something? Health care. Health care. I'm gonna, I think I'll throw that, okay, I think I'll throw that to a separate one. To what degree should the government be involved in providing health care to American workers or American people? What's another area that Americans feel a lot about, about whether or not the government does or does not allow certain actions to take, activities to take place by Americans? Immigration. Immigration policy. Can y'all think of some other ones? There's an area called culture that would be affected by culture. What are the hot button items that are culturally divisive in America as to whether or not Americans can do these things? There's about three I can think of. Is abortion one? Right? That's one. There's people who think that Americans can or cannot perform abortions. What's another cultural one you can think of? What? What is it? There you go. So, uh, and right now, the big one is marriage, I think there's two ways to say it, either same-sex marriage or marriage equality. If you say marriage equality, that means you're in favor of it. If you say uh, same-sex marriage, it means you're on the fence. Maybe I should do it on the fence and say same-sex marriage. Um, and then the third one might be marijuana usage, right? Are these all follow, I don't know, I'll just put pot, right? <laughs> so, or drugs, drug policies. You could also say gambling. These all fall under cultural values, right? And Americans divide into camps based on all of these things. Now, the political parties are going to emerge, and political parties are going to take a position on all these things, aren't they? By the way, another policy would be foreign policy. Do we or do we not get involved in taking our military around the world? And what about foreign aid policy? Do we or do we not give money to other countries and for what purpose, right? Those are all policy positions that our government take. And somehow or another, our parties get together on these issues, right? All right, how many parties do we have? We have two dominant parties. We have a two-party system. And somehow the parties are going to deal with all this. In the late 19th century, we're going to go back a little bit. You know, those issues aren't on there, are they? Abortion, marriage, and none of those things would be allowed in the 19th century. All right, I want to lay out the composition of the two parties. Now, we have a very stratified life in America that's beginning to emerge as a result of the changes taking place in America. About 1870, 90% of Southerners were, lived on farms, right? Northerners, about 80%. And as the, the late 19th century begins to change, we begin to change the way we live. Let's try to get our economic sectors down real quick. And let's think about 1880. What are, what are ways that people are making a living? I guess we could say ag first, right? We got a great number of people still involved in agriculture. What are other ways that people are making a living in 1880? Railroads. Railroads, now which part of it? So as a worker or a manager or an owner? Okay, well let's, so we're gonna have workers, and let's call it wage workers, right? Wage workers, who are working for somebody else. That's how they're making a living. And then you've got management, that's how they're making a living, maybe managing. And then um, some people are capitalists, right? They're the owners of this wealth. I just put bankers in there too. Capitalists, industrialists, bankers, big banks, finance. Throw them into that capital class. Any other way people are making a living? We got the small business people. That might be especially small retailers. These could be in small towns or in big towns. And then you've got the professional classes. You've got like the professions would be doctors, lawyers, academics, and ministry. All right, the profession. The majority of people are where? Waiters. 
point and an ag, right? Here's where most of the people are. And then as you go down here, you get smaller and smaller proportion of the population involved in this. All right, we're going to have to move these people into political parties. Who would be the most aligned? Who sh have shared values the most or shared interests? That's just a big thing. Shared interest is what's going to bring people together. What most motivates us in our interest? Do we want things that benefit us as a group? All of these people are going to want policies over there regarding the government that favor us or at least don't injure us, right? We don't want things to injure us. We don't want the government to pass a law that injures us. So you've got these different groups trying to make policies. And based on that, they come together in these parties. What you're going to see emerge here in a minute is going to be parties that can't meet the needs of all the people that are in them because of what might be good for capitalists might not be good for agricultural people, right? And we have conflict over what policies benefit one group may be costing the other. All right, that's my theme here that I want you to begin to think about abstractly. All right, let's look first at the Republican Party. The Republican Party was formed in about 1854 in Wisconsin in response to the aggressive growth of slavery and the question of whether or not slavery would move into Indiana and Ohio or into the new Western territories. Its initial makeup were Whigs. Whigs tended to be the wealthy Americans. They were the capitalists, industrialists, bankers, big banks, finance. Throw them into that capital class. Whigs tended to be that class. They were the ones who come from affluent backgrounds. They were also involved in shipping and transportation. They were the money people. The free soilers were the people from the Midwest, the small farmers, the agriculturalists. They joined the Republican Party because the Republican Party was not going to let slavery grow into their territory. And they were just going to keep slavery out of the Western territories as well. Because the free soilers didn't want to have to compete with slave labor. Nativists are people who tend to not like immigrants. So you're going to have a lot of people in New England who aren't liking the Irish come in in the 1830s and 40s and they're frustrated and they want to keep them out and they form their own party. Where would you put that? Probably wage workers. I would put that there too. Wage workers would be the ones who don't like immigrants coming in. So the, uh, you could add a third group, and that's the abolitionists. They end up joining the Republican Party, too. So the Republican Party is an amal amalgamation of several. What are their strongholds? Industrialists, bankers. I should put on small town, small town businessmen, small town professionals, by the way, mostly in the north. The professionals, including, like what I just mentioned, doctors, lawyers, academics. And then the rural north. That's the agriculturalists of the north. This is the Republican Party. Now, what's going to happen is, those different groups have got different economic interests, but they're all under one party. And the party is going to make, take a position on all these issues. And one policy benefits one within that group at the expense of the other. The question is, whose policies are going to be favored? If you looked at these groups, what would, you, what would be the largest number of people up from up there? If you had to count them, do a head count. What would be the largest single group of the popular? Which one? And when I say industrialists, I mean owners and managers, the actual people who own the stock, the Carnegies, the McCormicks, the Vanderbilts. If you counted up the people who were the owners and you counted up those other groups, who do you think would be the, the largest number of people? If you've got 80% of the population of the North is agriculturalists, would you think that that would lead you to conclude that probably the farmers are the largest group within the Republican Party? Would you think that they then would be in a position to make policy? No. <laughs> Why not? Would they numerically superior? Numbers mean nothing when they don't have the world to back it up. They're too isolated from one another. They're not organized, are they? They don't have the, the background to pull this off. Who does have the background to get together and meet with one another and, and say, these are the policies we want, and we want to send people to Washington that will do this for us? Yeah, the property people have this. So what you're going to see, they're going to be the ones who get to, to come up with the ideas of what is the proper role of the government in the economy. We call this political economy. And the position of these industrialists is the proper role of the government is to do things that would make them more wealthy. What kinds of things could they do? I'm going to give you a list here. Turn over the natural resources of America to private ownership. So all of the western timber, all the eastern timber, all of the coal supplies under the ground, all of the 
mineral deposits. Let's turn that over through the Homestead Act and other things. And, and the people who benefit most from that are going to be with people with capital who can come in and bring in machinery and cut down the forests and, and charge, you know, pay low wages to people who come out and work for the forest. Most of the money from those natural resources transfer into the capital class because they're the ones who bring the resources to it. An average person who goes out to the West and wants to cut down trees and bring them to the East Coast, are they going to be able to do that? No. It's going to take a lot of money to get it back there. They might get wages doing it, but most of the money is going to be through people who can bring the assets there, the equipment. They favor internal improvements. By that, we mean infrastructure. They favor mostly railroads, and they want the public land to be transferred to private railroads so that they will expand. That, by the way, is actually their own products that they own. Here's one I want you to pay attention to. They favor a protective tariff. You know what a tariff is? A tax on imported products. Why would the industrialists want to tax imported products? All right. By the way, why do you need to tax a product coming in? I mean, obviously, Americans are needing these products to be brought from abroad or else they wouldn't want to buy them. What would make an American want to buy a product that was made in Germany and England during this time as opposed to Chicago or Pittsburgh? Price. There you go. Price and quality is a factor. So for some reason, maybe because they're ahead, Europeans can make things less expensively and at a better quality. So we need to put a tariff on them so that they cost more so the American people won't buy that. Who does that favor? The industrials for the first group, right? They don't, and who doesn't benefit from it? The American people who are buying these things. So, uh, by the way, that's going to be the farmers. The farmers could buy cheaper plows from England and Germany. They could buy cheaper farm implements. They could buy cheaper fertilizers that are coming in. And if nothing else, if there wasn't the tariff, that at least the American producers of those products would have to compete on price, would they not? They don't have to compete as much on price. So the tariff goes to support and protect the interest of the capital class. Sound money. And you all read about this this week for this quiz, right, that you just took? That's the issue of what kind of currency do we want to have. We, at the time, had something called a bimetallic system. You could either pay in silver or you could pay in gold, and the government would mint both of those. But what I'd like you to know is that the bankers and the financiers and the capital class, they favor a, they called it sound money, but they wanted currency to be stable. They don't want big fluctuations in the value of money. How can a money become less valuable? What, is, what do we call it when money becomes less valuable? It takes more money to buy the same product. What do we call that? Inflation, right? They don't like an inflation. And let me explain to you very quickly why they don't like inflation. But how do banks make money? Interest rates that they charge on loans. Let's say they charge 6%. They're going to have some expenses involved in that, right? For one thing, they got to get money. How do they get money from people? Where do they get their money? From depositors, right? And how do they attract depositors to their bank? by offering an interest payment. So let's say they're offering 2% for interest. So how much are they really making then on a 6% loan? 4%. 4%, okay. Now, that's providing that the value of money is stable, that it, there's no inflation. But what if we have a 1% or 2% inflation on currency every year? What if there's a 1% inflation? What are they down to? They're down to 3% profit on this. So. And, and if a bank's going to make a long-term loan, five years, they don't want this to fluctuate. Now, in the late 19th century, as we, become, as we begin to discover silver deposits, and we begin to mint that silver, the industrials and capitalist class go, oh, wait a second, all this money is beginning to flood the market, and it's going to, it's going to cause inflation. And we need a sound money supply. Also, Europe is trying to go on simply a gold standard. We call this, what's the standard value of money? And so, on behalf of bankers and capital class, silver is a bad idea. And so they want to limit the amount of silver that will be minted every year. Now, who wants inflation? Who's inflation good for with regard to loans and such? Who wants to see, inflation leads to higher prices, right? Who would like to see the prices go up? Farmers, there you go. The farmers have got a problem on their hands. 
they've seen falling commodity prices from about 1870 all through the 1880. They're getting less money every year for the amount of wheat that they sell. And they're trapped in debt, high debt. So what they would like to see is rising prices. And they'd like to see a lot, if lots of money go into circulation, that means that's going to help them get out of debt. Can you see that we have a difference of opinion over what kind of currency uh, policies we should have? A policy that favors the capital class comes at the expense of the farming class. How are we going to deal with that difference of interest? Who's going to decide? The major people who end up making the decisions are going to be the industrialists, the bankers, and they're going to, these are the policies of the Republican, of the Republican Party. And uh, what I'd like you to know is these two things right here are what are most troublesome to the agricultural class. So the rural north have got a problem with these policies, but they do it anyway. So now the question is, if you're going to do something that upsets part of your party, what's the danger of doing something that upsets part of your party? They might leave. Now, the good thing for the Republicans is the Democratic Party at that time probably is not willing to do what the farmers want either, so they're kind of safe. But what you don't want them to do, if you leave one party and go to the other, do you know what that's called? It's called pa crossing party lines, right? You're going from one group to the other. Do the Republican leadership want you to leave and go vote for another party? No. They don't. They want you to have loyalty to your party. So what they begin to get smart on this. How can we keep these people in the Republican Party? One thing they do is they use patronage. Patronage is when you support people with a check, right? That's patronage or with a position. So you've got this protective tariff that's bringing in all this money that's because, by the way, the industrials can't supply America with all the products we need. So we are importing a lot of things. That makes the government a wash in money. So what they do is they start supporting these rural northern farmers who had fought in the Civil War. They send them veterans benefits. Also, widows begin to get a check in the mail from the government. Is that going to keep you loyal? Do you, are you loyal to, to a party that sends you a check? That is one way to get, it wouldn't that today we also use tax credits and things like that to keep loyalty or some kind of tax structure that makes you like that party. And I want us to think about that in class. Um, the other thing you can do is put some psychology in there. Don't go to the other party because the other party is bad, morally bad. This is a, something that the Republicans are going to try to use. So I guess you could say there's a carrot and a stick, kind of. You try two approaches. You give things to the group that you want to stay with you. And then the other part is to say the other group is bad. And there's a phrase that we use that the Republicans use to describe the Democratic Party. They've said to their small rural people and other ones who might be tempted to go to the Democratic Party, they'd say, you cannot go vote for the Democratic Party. That's an evil group. That is the party that stands for rum, Romanism, and rebellion. Let me add one more thing about the ethnic makeup of the Republican Party. What do you think the ethnic makeup of it is? Quite a few of the what? Oh, that was only in the South. But you're going to see by the 1870s and 80s, the Republican Party in the South gets destroyed during the, during the Mississippi Klan. Once the federal troops get taken out of the South, they all go back to the Democratic Party. There are no, yes, if there are any Republicans in the South, it's going to be blacks who can't vote anyway now because of Jim Crow laws. And maybe a few people from like northern, eastern Tennessee who, never, who remain Republicans but because they didn't like the planter class. But in the North, it's, I put this down about the Republican Party, overwhelmingly Anglo, Protestant, Northwestern Europeans, original old stock American. The old stock is what we kind of call them sometimes. They reflect that first hundred years of immigration to America. Northwestern Europe, Anglo, God, Scots Irish, German, Dutch, Scandinavian countries. They tended to all be Protestant, and during the 1800s, they tended to all become anti-alcohol people. They believed that alcohol was the bane of human society. That is what's called the temperance movement. The temperance movement of the 1900s when we were trying to get rid of problems in our society and they decided the greatest evil for American society doing well and people in poverty and such was alcohol abuse. And so for the Republican Party to say that the Democratic Party is the party of rum, that means that the Democratic Party is tolerant of alcohol. 
and alcohol is a destroyer of families and society. So the next thing is Romanism. Don't know what that means? You want to make a guess? It's the party of people who are not Protestant. It's Catholics. Romanism means Catholics. And the since the Anglos are saying they are projecting in America that the rise of the, the, the emergence of the Catholic Church in America, which had not been seen in the early part of the American uh, century, or the 19th, 17th and 18th century, is a dangerous thing because England and Northwestern Europe had become anti-Catholic because they saw Catholicism as being the tool that absolute monarchs used to control the population. And so American colonists had a very anti-Catholic viewpoint. And then rebellion. Why would you say the Democratic Party was a party of rebellion? Why could they say that? Because the Democratic Party was a party that allowed the Civil War to go forward, right? So you cannot possibly cross party lines. You'd be joining the party of Rome, the party of the Roman Catholic Church, and the party that supported the, uh, the Civil War to go forward. So would you feel bad about voting Democrat if you were a Northern Republican? In fact, the phrase they use is, vote as you shot, boys, right? If you were, right, you're civil, how can you even possibly thinking, think about that, about voting for the other side? This is some of the cartoons that we published at the time. Here's the Democratic Party. Yeah, I guess it's about, I don't know what he's doing there. I don't know if he's getting the goods out. This is supposed to be a nefarious Catholic person here, right? And who would that be based on that video I showed you last week? The Irish. The Irish, right? If you're an immigrant who's coming here from Europe and you're not coming from Protestant Europe, are you going to feel a warm welcome by the Republican Party? Yeah. You're not. And so what party would you go to? Democrats. You would go to the Democratic Party. So the Democratic Party is where immigrants increasingly go to if you're in the north. Not in the, by the way, immigrants aren't going to the south, are they? They're going to the north for jobs and therefore they go into the Democratic Party. Here's this other thing. Vote as you shot. Sometimes they would even do dramatic things like bring in a Civil War shirt to have blood all over it. And they'd say, remember the blood that was spilt, trying to suppress that rebellion. And so we're using psychology to maintain political loyalty. All right, now let's go to the Democratic Party. Who are they? The initial makeup was the, it was the work of Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson later in the next generation. Now, this is back to the time when, again, it's going to appeal to that same Northwestern Protestant group, but it's appealing to average white men, not property elite men like Alexander Hamilton or the Adams families and these wealthy people. Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson want to make their government reflective of the needs of the average American yeoman farmer. And they didn't like this guy, Alexander Hamilton, who had all these ideas that would grow wealth in America and commerce. It came with the expense of the average farmer through policies like the tariff and infrastructure. Same, same story, just a different time. Here are the strongholds. Solid South becomes the major stronghold of the Democratic Party. All Southern states, after Reconstruction, they returned to the Democratic Party. And they formed party loyalty too in the South. They said the Republican Party was a party that was trying to increase African American equality and elevate African Americans in American life, which of course Southern, Southern whites thought was a horrible idea. In the Solid South, the Democratic Party becomes a party that's going to preserve white supremacy in the South. That is it's going, it's what it's going to do, and it's going to keep down, as they said, the three million African American citizens of the Southern states. And they see the Republican Party as the party that brought the war on. The War of Northern Aggression is what they call it. They don't call it the War of Rebellion. They call it the War of Northern Aggression. So that's how they're going to get party loyalty in the South. Now here's the weird thing about it. The Northern part of the party is increasingly made up of immigrants. By the way, the, the Solid South, they tended to have the same cultural values as Northern Republicans. They tended to favor temperance. They tended to not like immigrants. They tended to not like Catholics and Jews and Greek Orthodox. They saw that sinister too, but because the Republican Party had favored advancing African Americans and because of the Civil War, Southern whites do not agree with Northern white Anglos, okay? There's that divide between them and it's over the place of African Americans. So I say that the Democratic Party becomes schizophrenic. It's got two different distinct personalities, that, but they all call themselves Democrats. And they meet you know, every four years in these national conventions. Northern urban immigrant communities don't hold the values of the white Southerners. 
they are in favor of taverns, and they are Catholic, and they are Jewish, and they are Greek Orthodox. They, they don't have the same value. So it's weird. It's this schizophrenic thing, which will eventually, by the way, the, the dominant white Anglo cl class that we've talked about eventually become primarily identified with the Republican Party in the, after 1960, right? Last 30, 40 years has been most, most, unless they're, well, I'll talk about those differences later on. What about their position on political economics? They call for little action to the federal government. They prefer states' rights, is what they talked about. They don't want a lot of government. It seemed like to them that any government policies so far had been favoring the wealthy. They did want lower tariffs because most Democrats, at least in the South, tended to be agriculturalists. I didn't mention this, but if we slap a tariff on imported industrial products from Germany and from England and France, how, does, how do the businessmen in England and France and Germany feel about us putting a tariff so that we, they can't sell our, their products here? Do they like that? They don't. So what are they going to do? They're going to retaliate. How could Germany and France and England retaliate against our tariffs? They, they put tariffs on the products that we sell them. What are, does that bother Mr. McCormick, who makes plows? Why doesn't it bother Mr. McCormick if the Germany is putting a tariff on products sent to from America to Germany? Yeah. Can he compete? Can McCormick compete in Germany? No. No, because they've already got it at a lower price and good quality. What are we then selling to Europe? Food. Food, right? That's the thing. We're sending wheat and corn to Europe. So Mr. McCormick's not worried about that. So who is? Right? And, and oh, but we can even look at the north. This is the problem. The tariff not only favors industrialists in the north so that farmers have to pay more money for farm implements and fertilizers and all those things. Guess what? The retaliatory tariff back over in Europe makes it so that American farmers can't sell as much product over there. So the American farmers are getting it from both sides. They're paying higher prices for these commodities, for these products they need, and they're able to sell less. Is that frustrating for farmers? It's going to be enormously. This tariff is one of the biggest issues for them of anything. That and the currency issue. A Southern Democrats did favor lower tariffs because they didn't like the retaliatory tariff on cotton. They're kind of split over this expansive currency policy thing. You know, I should add another policy, and that's bank regulation. What regulations might one put on a bank? Interest rates, you could say that there's a certain level of on, uh, beyond which you can't charge interest. You know how banking works? They take all these deposits in. You know what reserves, what reserves are? Reserves are what banks hold in their banks in case somebody comes and asks for a deposit because you're supposed to pay your deposits on demand, right? So they get all these deposits in, but they're making loans. What's the temptation there? I mean, here's the question. How much do I keep in reserves? They start figuring out that only about 5% of the money that's deposited it will actually ever be asked for by the depositors. So that means they can loan out a lot of money. I want you to know something else that banks used to do in the 19th century and early 20th century. We didn't have a national currency the way we do paper money. Banks were allowed to issue their own currency. Paper, they would print up checks. And let's say you came and got a loan from a bank, they wouldn't give you coin. They could give you paper. And they would say, pay the bearer of this document $5 at our bank in Cedar Falls, Iowa, right? If this piece of paper comes back to our bank, we promise to give you $5 in gold. So it's their own printed currency backed by gold and silver. Okay, so they start giving out loans for this stuff and they pay money. So you're, you're the person who's got this loan from them. What do you do with that paper? You go out and start spending it, right? And now somebody gets your paper and they're like, okay, I can either go down and get $5 from that bank or I can do what with it? I can spend it somewhere else. And so what we have circulating in America in the late 1800s is all these little banks with all this paper money. And what do the banks hope that will happen? What was that? They'll never come home to roost, right? And so they start figuring out that they can make lots of loans well beyond what they have in deposits. And they can just, they can just push this money out. And they hope it'll get further and further away. So what happens now is this currency might end up in Boston or in, in New York. And what begins to happen is people start making money on uh, becoming clearing houses. Let's say you want to pay for something and you show up and you've got all these currencies. And now the people in New York want gold or silver for it. Are they going to go to Iowa to get this thing? No. 
clearing houses begin to operate so that they will collect all these checks, but will they give you full face value for it? No. Because you've got to go out there and get the money, right? So they start to discount it. They'll say, I'll give you, on this currency from Iowa, I'll give you 60% of face value. This currency from Boston, I'll give you 90% face value. And so this is how this stuff begins to work. Now, Republicans tended to f not like the speculative actions of banks. Remember those collapses I talked to you about before? Do, if there's ever a collapse, this money comes home to roost because people have to cover their, banks have to cover their loans with gold and silver. So we've got big problems in the way that our banking system works in America. And Republicans tended to favor federal laws to regulate state banks. And the Democratic Party tended to favor the small state banks that could get away with lots of shenanigans. So that's another division between the property and the non -profit. I know that's very complicated, isn't it? We don't ever come to deal with currency in America. How do we deal with currency today? Who is do private banks issue currency? No. Who issues currency for the United States? The Federal Reserve, right? That is coming up for us in our class. It's, in the, in the progr it's a progressive era reform in the 19 All right, the Agrarian Revolt. This is your ID, the People's Party. The People's Party slash Omaha platform. Northern farmers, Midwest and West, get really, really irritated at the fact that the Republican Party will not lower the tariff and that it's committed to the gold currency. And they've got other problems that they need support for. And they don't like the railroads either, right? This anger. And so, because the Republican Party won't do anything for them, they begin to form a third party. You know, in American history, we have third parties every once in a while. And the third parties emerge when one of the two parties will not, on those policies, adopt their position. Okay. So, by the way, here's what they want. Here's what the farmers want. They want a lower tariff and they want an expansive money supply. They want the free coinage of silver. There's been, a, there's been a limit on how much silver can be minted every year, and they're saying, mint any amount of silver that comes to a mint, they've been, we're gonna require that the mint prints it up as coin. They want to flood the market with as much currency as possible, and that will raise commodity prices for them, and that will help them get out of debt. They want to lower the tariff so that they pay lower money for imported products that they need to farm and that they can sell more to Europe because the Europeans will lower their tariff rates most likely too. This is the most radical thing that they want to do. They want the government to, t to buy out the railroad companies, to take them over, to nationalize them. They're the first group in American history that would, that would call for what we would call socialism, right? Government ownership and operation of a major industry, not for a profit, but for on behalf of the public people, like a public utility or something like that, or maybe a public transportation system. They were the telegraph nationalized too. That's pretty radical, isn't it? But the bankers and, and the uh, bankers aren't going to like this, and the railroads aren't going to like this. Now, here's another thing they want. They've got a problem in their hands. Farmers, when's the harvest for them? Uh, late summer, July and August, all this wheat's coming in. They were just praying it didn't rain before they get the wheat in. What do they do with it back in 1870 when they get all this grain in? Do they put it in their barn? Why can't they leave it in their barn for very long? Because it will get mold on it and it will be it will become it will be of no value. Uh, so they got to sell it in July and August. If all the farmers are selling in July and August, is that a good idea? No. What? Because what does that do to price? It drops it. When would it be the highest price for grain in the calendar year, do you suppose? Probably January, February. There you go, January, February, when there's no other options there. So what they begin to think is, gee whiz, if we could just hold our food back from August when the buyers are buying for nothing and hold it back until like January, February, the price would come up. But they've got nowhere to put this grain. And so what they call for is public granaries. They want the government to loan them money to, for cooperatives to build big grain silos. Have you ever seen those things? In small, small, that's the birth of the big grain silo movement. They, but they don't have the money themselves to do it. They want the government to loan them the money and then the farmers would pay them back the, the government over time, maybe 20 or 30 years, because they don't have the debt to do it. They also, they, don't, they want postal savings banks. Every post office in America, they believe, could be a government-run credit union, basically. And they think that would be a great way to help them in their financial needs. 
Also, they're looking at the wealth of the industrialists and the differentials, and they need to pay for certain programs, and so they wanted a graduated income tax. And they know that the senators in America are not popularly elected. They're, they're elected by the legislatures. And the state legislatures are sending the two senators to Washington. And it's, they're only reflecting the interests of the capital class. So this is what they want. And since the Republican Party won't do it, and be, because the no, you can't go vote Democrat, can you? And the Democratic Party is not offering us either. So they make a third party. And that party, they're going to meet in Omaha, Nebraska. And they're going to create what is called the People's Party. All of these policies that the farmers are calling for amount to a great increase of the role in government, in the economy, in ways that benefit them. And their policies will be adopted not during their decade that they're calling for it because they don't have enough power, but by the time we get into the first decade and second decade of the 20th century, we're going to have new political leaders who will answer the call of various different groups in America who have never had their policies implemented and they will seek most of those. Most of what the farmers call for in their 1892 Omaha platform will be accomplished by 1914. Those include a lower tariff, changes in the banking structure of America including the Federal Reserve Act, the direct election of U.S. Senators, a graduated income tax, and also public granaries. The one thing they don't get that they clamored for was government control of railroads and the telegraph. However, they will get regulations put on railroads that do accomplish much of what they wanted during the Progressive Era. Uh, by the way, it's a Gran Granger system that's identifying their problems and now they're coming up with their solutions. By the way, they begin to m meet in state conventions. Then they start meeting nationally because they decide the Republican Party won't listen to them and they can't join the Democratic Party for their grandfather's sake or their own sake. All right, there we talked about the Grange a little bit. From the Grange, the people, farmers meeting, they begin to form what are called the Farmers Alliance in the, in the 1880s. Farmers Alliance are groups of organized farmers who come to these meetings and they're ready to raise hell over the, the treatment they believe they're getting from these wealthy people in the East. And then they start sending representatives and they have a state, as I said, a state alliance meeting. And now they want to have a national alliance meeting. They do try to attract labor. And I should mention this. One of the problems of a modern economy is what's good for one group is not good for another group. If the farmers got their way, prices of food would go up, right? Because they want to hold grain off the market. They want to see rising wheat prices. Who would that hurt, potentially? Someone's going to hurt from this. Is it going to hurt Mr. Rockefeller? Mm -mm, he doesn't care. He's got so much money. He doesn't care. Who's going to hurt? The average people in cities, the laborers in cities, are going to hurt from higher grain prices. They're going, gee whiz. A lot of workers are also worried about what if tariffs come down? If tariff comes down and it makes it so that products can be imported from England at a lower price and more Americans buy that, what happens if you're a worker in a factory? Potentially. If Americans start buying other products, what happens to American workers? So they're tied to the same boat that the wealthy people who own the companies are. So that's what the farmers realize. We've got to let labor know that we're with them. And so they start saying, Here's, we're in favor of some things you want. You need higher wages. We want uh, a 40 work week. And any time, anything past 40 hours in a week, you get time and a half for. We're looking for, we're interested in labor's organization too, to get higher wages. You'll be able to afford this bread price that goes up because you'll get paid more. And they're also in favor of an eight hour work day too, because the workers in the 1880s were just being worked, we'll talk about that next time, what workers are up to. So they do try to attract labor, but they're not very successful at it. They do have a lot of success on the state levels, and they begin to have Farmers Alliance senators from Kansas and Iowa and Montana and Wyoming. In 1892, they're so frustrated with the Republican Party that they meet in Omaha, Nebraska. Nice place for farmers to meet, right? And they, they put forward what is called the Omaha Platform. That is your ID, finally. The Omaha Platform. 
It's this series of resolutions that their party stands for. And I already gave them to you all, except that they add the eight hour workday and the right for labor to organize. And they say we're not voting Republican and we're not voting Democrat and we're voting, we're going to put forward our own presidential candidate. We're going to put forward our own candidates on the state level to go represent us in, in Washington. Do they win? They don't win. They get a small percentage of the population, but they do pretty well. Now here's the final phenomenon I want you to know. This is what is called the third party movement. A third party emerges when both of the two parties do not represent the economic interest of a group and that they're being ignored and the, this group feels hurt by it. And there's a lot of them and they get organized and they say, we're done with you guys. And the third party movement. Now, do the third parties make it in American history? Not very often. What happens usually is one of the parties goes after them. The, two, the parties start thinking, gee whiz, the Republicans start thinking, gee, maybe we should change our policies to try to get these people back. But, and honestly, the Republicans simply, the wealthy people simply would not do that. They were willing to maybe uh, uh, bump pensions and maybe do same thing, something for farmers. But here's what happens. This is your last guy, Williams Jenning Bryan, William J. Bryan. He is from Nebraska. He's going to be the youngest man to run for president. He's like 37 years old. He's a Democrat from Nebraska. And what he wants to see the Democratic Party do is change its policies and adopt policies that would get the farmers, the Northern Republican farmers, to come vote for the Democratic Party. And he, the, here's how the conventions work. Here's how you got a nomination back in the old days. Nobody knew who the nominee was going to be going to the convention. The party people would come to a convention and they would nominate somebody. And there'd be all these speeches. And you wouldn't know it till the end. And what William Jennings Bryan does is he do, makes a brilliant speech. It's called the Cross of Gold speech. The Democrats are split over whether or not to go to the gold standard or silver standard. And he, here's what he does. He says, it's called the cross of gold speech because he says to, he says, the American bankers and the industrials are taking advantage of us. They are crucifying us on a cross of gold. Now he uses religious imagery because he's trying to overthrow this idea that the Democratic Party is not about normal evangelical Christianity. He's like, I'm a Protestant. I'm under he's speaking the language to northern farmers. He's like, don't let religion be a... because we're just as religious as you guys. And don't listen to the Republicans when they say we're not religious. Because we are. And he says, don't let them put this cross, uh, crucify us on the cross of gold or press down this crown of thorns on her head. But what he's doing is he's moving the Democratic Party firmly into the, to the biometallic system, trying to attract the farmers in, and here's what happens. He makes this speech before, this is 1896, it's the next election cycle, before the People's Party nominates somebody, and the Democrats decide to nominate him. And that's a strong signal to the farmers, the People's Party, and so the People's Party decide to nominate him too. And we had this really big showdown in the 1896 election. We're out of time, but I'll try to finish this next time and show you how the Republicans respond to it, and then we'll get back to industrialization.